the Holy Gospel of our Lord according to St. John. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Chapter 6. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is that of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. Jesus therefore went up into a mountain, and there he sat with the disciples. Now the Pasch, the festival day of the Jews, was near at hand. When Jesus therefore had lifted up his eyes and seen that a very great multitude cometh to him, he said to Philip, Whence shall we buy bread, that these may eat? And this he said to try them, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, said to him, There is a boy here that hath five barley loaves and two fishes, but what are these among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. The men therefore sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to them that were set down. In like manner also the fishes, as much as they would. And when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, lest they be lost. They gathered up, therefore, and filled twelve baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above to them that had eaten. Now those men... When they had seen what a miracle Jesus had done, said, This is of truth the prophet that is come into the world. Jesus, therefore, when he knew that they would come to take him by force and make him king, fled again into the mountain himself alone. And when evening was come, his disciples went down to the sea. And when they had gone up into a ship, they went over to the sea of Capernaum, and it was now dark, and Jesus was not come unto them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. When they had rowed, therefore, about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking upon the sea and drawing nigh to the ship, and they were afraid. But he saith to them, It is I, be not afraid. They were willing, therefore, to take him into the ship, and presently the ship was at the land to which they were going. The next day the multitude that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other ship there but one, and that Jesus had not entered into the ship with his disciples, but that his disciples were gone away alone. But other ships came from Tiberias, nigh unto that place where they had eaten the bread, the Lord giving thanks. When therefore the multitude saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they took shipping and came to Capernaum, seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Amen, amen, I say to you, truly you seek me, not because you have seen miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that which endureth unto life everlasting, which the Son of Man will give you, for him hath God the Father sealed. They said therefore unto him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered them and said, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he hath sent. They said therefore to him, What sign therefore dost thou show, that we may see and may believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, Moses gave you not bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. 
For the bread of God is that which cometh down from heaven and giveth life to the world. They said therefore unto him, Lord, give us always this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall not hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. But I say unto you that you also have seen me, and you believe not. All that the Father giveth to me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will not cast out. Because I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all that he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again on the last day. And this is the will of my Father that sent me, that every one who seeth the Son and believeth in him may have life everlasting, and I will raise him up on the last day. The Jews therefore murmured at him, because he had said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How then saith he, I came down from heaven? And Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not amongst yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father who hath sent me draw him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every one that hath heard of the Father, and hath learned, cometh to me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, but he who is of God, he hath seen the Father. Amen, amen, I say unto you, he that believeth in me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the desert and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that if any man eat of it, he may not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath ever everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood abideth in me and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, the same also shall live by me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, he that eateth this bread shall live forever. These things he said, teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples hearing it said, This saying is hard. Who can hear it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured at this, said to them, Doth this scandalize you? If then you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that did not believe and who he was that would betray him. And he said, Therefore did I say to you that no man can come to me unless it be given him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Will you also go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have known that thou art the Christ, the Son of God. 
Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Now he meant Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for this same was about to betray him, or as he was one of the twelve. Thus far are the words of the Holy Gospel. Praise to thee, O Christ. Well, for Catholics, this is one of the most powerful and popular passages in all four Gospels. John 6, it has the bread of life discourse in it. And it's where we learn about the Eucharist. It's where we learn about transubstantiation. Our Lord is very explicit. And he says, my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he says, we must eat it. Why is this? In the Old Testament, the sacrifices, first there was the slaying of the animal. If we think of the Passover lamb, first they killed the Passover lamb. Then they shed its blood. In the case of the Passover lamb, they put the blood over the door. And that blood was atonement. That blood was propitiation. But that wasn't enough. God also commanded that they eat the Passover lamb. Okay, so there's a three-stage pattern here. Slay the lamb, shed and spread the blood, and then eat the lamb. That is the sacrifice. And here we see that this whole thing begins on the... Verse 4, now the Pasch, the festival day of the Jews. So this is all around Passover. And our Lord, of course, is taking this opportunity to teach them that they must eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Lamb of God, who is Christ our Lord. Now, it begins with the feeding of the 5,000. They don't have any food. And uh, a little over a year ago, we, uh, we led a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and we went to the site where this happened in the Holy Land. I'm going to show you a picture. This is an altar. Do you see that rock below the altar? That is the place, according to tradition, where Christ multiplied these five barley loaves and the two fish and fed the multitude. Now, there's an interesting ancient mosaic on the floor. I think you can see that there on the screen. It's right there. There's the two fishes. And then if you look into the basket, there's only four loaves. Now, the gospel clearly says there's five loaves and two fishes. So why would the artist who made this mosaic put two fishes and four loaves right here by the rock where Christ transformed or multiplied the loaves? The reason is, is because early on, Christians were celebrating the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the Eucharist. And the fifth loaf that's missing from the Mosaic is on the altar. It is the Eucharist. So the artist clearly here omitted or left out one of the loaves from his Mosaic, pointing that the fifth loaf would be on the altar. It's a wonderful place to, to visit. And I think we will be leading another pilgrimage uh, to the Holy Land. This past year, we were going to lead a, a pilgrimage to Fatima and Spain and Lourdes and France, but it was canceled because of COVID. But we're going to try to reschedule that. And then one day also go again uh, to the Holy Land to see these amazing places where Christ did these miracles. So that's the multiplication of the loaves. Uh, you'll hear modernist heretics, naturalists, who will say, well, uh, Christ didn't really multiply bread and fish. What happens is, is a little boy, he shared his five loaves and fish, and that inspired everyone else to share their pack lunches, and everyone ended up getting a bunch of food. Uh, that's blasphemous. That's not at all what the scriptures present to us. No church father, no doctor of the church has ever interpreted this chapter as a miracle of sharing. You see, heretics, modernists, naturalists, they strip out the supernatural to the natural. So they make every miracle into some natural event. And that's what they do to this passage right here. And the reason I bring that up is because the second half of John 6 is about the Eucharist and how Christ will provide a way that bread will transform, transubstantiate into his flesh. 
and that miraculously we will receive his true historical flesh with our mouths. Well, if the miracle of multiplication was not really a supernatural miracle, but a natural phenomenon of people sharing their lunches, that just means that the miracle of the Eucharist is just sort of a natural, symbolic bread and wine symbolizes uh, the, the body and blood of Christ, like most Protestants believe. We just can't have that. That is not historical, biblical, traditional Christianity. So it must be rejected. Now, after he multiplies the loaves, we also have him walking on the water. What's going on here? Well, we see that he can multiply loaves, bread, but we also see that his body is supernatural. It's a true physical body. It is a body derived from the womb of the Virgin Mary, but there are special supernatural gifts given to the body of Christ. So this also reveals that just as Christ can do supernatural things with bread, his body has supernatural principles. And then he teaches us about transubstantiation. So if Christ has power over bread and his body is not like a normal sinful body, but has these supernatural gifts, then once he's established both of those facts, he can then teach his apostles and the disciples who will hear it that he will give his body to be eaten. Okay, so both of the incidents lead up to the teaching on transubstantiation, the bread of life discourse. So just a few thoughts on the bread of life discourse. He begins saying, I'm the bread of life. Moses gave you bread to your ancestors. They're all dead. And the, and the bread that I give you will give you life everlasting. He says in verse 53, the Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So the Jews are not cannibals. They've been taught not to do that. All right. The Jews were prepared by God to not eat human flesh. It's gross, it's sinful, and it's disgusting to eat dead human flesh. However, the Jews were also prepared with the mysteries of the sacrifices, which were sacramental rites. They weren't sacraments, but they were sacramental rites. And they should have known that the Messiah, who is the Lamb of God, they should have been disposed to understanding that the Messiah would not just be a sacrifice and a suffering servant, but that he would have to be brought into the interior of a man. And the sacrifices of the Old Testament showed that sacrifices must be eaten by priest and by people. That was the pattern that God set up. And so Christ is trying to show them that, look, you're not going to be eating dead flesh. That's cannibalism. You're going to be eating resurrected, resurrected body and blood, living flesh, living blood, not dead, not carrion. That's the principle here. So the Jews are confounded. And he said this teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. It was great to be in Capernaum or Capernaum. Um, we were with Father Hallwell and Father Hallwell read what inside the synagogue space is still there in Capernaum. And we stood in that synagogue space and Father Hallwell read this passage where Christ himself had said it himself. It was amazing to hear John 6 in the context of where it had been first uttered by Christ. And then in verse 61, it says, many of the disciples hearing it said, this is, this saying is hard. Who can hear it? It is difficult. It's perhaps the most difficult teaching in Christianity. First off, we believe when we look at the Eucharist, we believe that it is not just a man, but it is the God man, fully God and fully man. It is sinless, immaculate, pure flesh of the Messiah. And that the Messiah, not only is he fully man, he's also fully God and consubstantial with God the Father. And so when we receive the Eucharist, we are partaking, as Peter says in 2 Peter, 
We are partaking of the divine nature. And that's why he says, whoever eats my flesh will live forever. Because we are uniting with Jesus Christ. And, you know, one of the great things that you can say to, to non-Catholics when they hear about transubstantiation, what we believe, that we believe the Mass is the sacrifice of Christ and we truly eat Christ. That's what we believe. You can, you can say to them, they'll be like, ah, I don't know, that sounds wrong, that's weird, that's gross. Um, you can say, well, what would be more intimate than to truly, physically, metaphysically, have Christ come into you at church on Sunday? Wouldn't you want that to be true? Wouldn't you want that to be true? That church would not just be songs and a sermon, but that there would be that intimate union of Christ in us and us in Christ. That's what the Eucharist is. That's what the Mass is. And then, verse 67, after this, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Christ lost a large part of his following at this point. And Christ didn't say, hey guys, wait, 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 I was just, I was just, it's symbolic. Don't be, don't be weirded out by this. Don't be grossed out. It's symbolic. Come back, come back. Christ let him walk because he realized it was a hard teaching. And then he tests the apostles and he says, will you also go away? And Simon Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. It's almost like he's saying, I don't fully understand it, but I've seen you do miracles. I saw you multiply loaves, so I know you have some kind of power over bread. And then I also saw you walk on water, and so I know your body is not like our body. There's something special about that as well. So I know that those two mysteries of your power over bread and then the power of your body over nature, I know that those mysteries will somehow fit together, and that will be eternal life for us. And so he doesn't go. Also at the very end, last observation, uh, Christ says, have I not chosen you the 12 and one of you is the devil? He meant Judas Iscariot. It's interesting. John's gospel doesn't have the last supper in it. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have the last supper. John's gospel doesn't have it. But we know in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospel that the devil enters into Judas after he, when he's leaving from the last supper. So the betrayal of Jesus happens in the context of the Eucharist when he says, this is my body, this is my blood. It's almost like here, in a poetic way, John is telling that story. In a way, this is sort of the Last Supper where Christ teaches that the bread and wine is his body and blood. And then at the end, he says, one of you is the devil. And he was talking about Judas Iscariot. So, And I talked about this the other day on the, on the YouTube channel here, that the mystery of betrayal the mystery of Judas priests, Judas bishops, the mystery of infiltration of the demonic inside the church that betrays Christ, it's related to the mystery of the Eucharist and the, the, the denial of the Eucharist. These things go together. And the way we overcome the infiltration of the Judas is by being more and more focused and more and more faithful to the teaching here in John 6. My flesh is meat indeed. My blood is drink indeed. All right, with that, we will uh, we'll close in a prayer. We'll pray the Ave Maria for all those who do not believe in this mystery of transubstantiation. Oremus. In nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus tecum. Benedicto tu in mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tu, Iesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei. Or pro nobis peccatoribus nunc et et mortis nostre. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, sicut erat in principio et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. Almighty God, we pray for all those who don't have faith, as Jesus says in this gospel, that you would draw them by the power of God, draw them to the truth, to believe and to confess and to receive Jesus' body and blood in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, as it says in Scripture. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right, everybody. Thanks so much 
for watching. And uh, if you know someone who maybe needs to hear this, please like the video. And more importantly, please share the video by using the share button. You can share it on Parler, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, Facebook, I think, is the best, but Parler's making a lot of headway too. And if you're new, please subscribe. There's a little subscribe button in the corner on YouTube. Please click that and hit the bell and subscribe. And every time I do a live video or a reading of John's Gospel, you'll be notified and you can join me live. Thanks so much for watching. And remember our Lord Jesus Christ that you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless and Godspeed.